Okay, uh, we're trying something new this morning, so I hope everyone will be patient with us. Uh, I'd sure like to be with everyone this morning, but uh, there's right now there's just not any way that I could sit in a suit um, for a couple hours. Uh, I'll just do the best I can do here today in my office with the, this youth Zoom meeting. Thank God for, for technology. That's uh, it's amazing what all can be done today through technology. I asked Brother Leninger one time, you know, he just kept talking about the last prophetical hour was 15 years. And I said, how are we going to get all this done in 15 years? And he said, well, Brother Smith, we can't change the scriptures. And I said, I'm not trying to change them. I just want to know how we can get it done in 15 years. And I, you've heard me say this before, most of you, that, you know, he said, well, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, he had three missionary journeys, and, and each one of them, he either had to walk, ride a donkey, or, or a boat. And he was gone, you know, for years uh, on each journey. And uh, he said, you, you can, you can, at that time, he said, you can be in the Dominican Republic and, you know, in just two or three hours of an airplane flight. Zoom wasn't even a, available to us at the time, at that time, but. Now we have a Zoom meeting every Monday night with people in the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and Guatemala, uh, and uh, Ch Chile, and I think we had some on there from Spain. And anyway, it's just unbelievable that what you can do now, and I can, I can talk to pastors and ministers and get this message to them a lot faster through Zoom than I could going over there and trying to visit a church and, you know, uh, I can't spend the time with them that I can right here on a Zoom meeting. So anyway, Brother William Souders always said that, that all of these improvements are, uh, they're all God given for the for his church the world uses it the world gets the benefit of it but most of what god's doing is for the church just like you know when uh, the reformation started and the bibles were printed in english you know pencils and paper was established printers and and uh you know even airplanes mode of transportation and and all God's what he's interested in is getting his this gospel out to the known Gentile world and harvesting whatever he can harvest out of it. Um, so uh, I um, I am I don't know if Brother Painter is going to be able to do this live. I sort of think he can, but if not, I am recording it and we can post it to our WhatsApp page and then he can actually redo it, put it on YouTube and post it on our YouTube page. So, so if it don't go out live, it'll at least be, it will go out later today. Anyway, um, I wanted to, I wanted to say something more on the, uh, resurrection of the dead i have finished that that article actually rewrote a big part of it uh or i should maybe say i rewrote part of, i rewrote some new things and i re rearranged it where i think it's easier to be understood by most people and so it's it's ready for print um but the article that y'all got houses the the majority of 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 what's in the new article. Um, uh, one of the things that I want to 
I would like to address, there's two things that I'd, I'd like to mention in Revelations, the 20th chapter. And this has to do with, this has to do with the resurrection. But the first part of it that I want to mention is uh, that uh, the apostle John, the angel, here in the first verse said he saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Uh, and he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That's the, there's only one other place that all four categories of evil is mentioned in one verse like this. All four of them, the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan. Uh, and that's in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelations, where it's explaining the, the war that took place between the great red dragon and Michael and his angels. Uh, that was the, the war that of the New Testament church and the beast system back there. Uh, but this here is after the battle of Armageddon, uh, God is going to bind uh, evil. Uh, actually, the dragon, the beast system will actually be destroyed before Armageddon. But here he just gives all four categories and evil will be bound for a thousand years. He said he cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up. That bottomless pit is a false religious element, even though it won't be in a dragon system form anymore, there still will be false systems of religion down through the thousand years. It'll take God and the bride uh, several hundred years to finally uh, reach the whole world and bring the world into subjection to righteousness. Um, Isaiah, I believe, said that he that dieth at a hundred years old would be accursed. So down through the thousand years, once God has included whatever category or group of people you, a person might be in, it looks like that they would have up to a hundred years to, to overcome the sinful nature and inherit life. And if they lived a hundred years and died, it would be because they rejected the, the plan of God. Um, anyway, so sin will basically be bound and righteousness will uh, prevail and be in the majority down through the thousand years, which uh, you know, right now you, you look at the conditions of the world and you wonder how in the world is God ever going to do this. But if you looked at the condition of the, the Jewish world, when Jesus came to that world, it was in a very poor condition also. So God's able, he's able to harness uh, wickedness and cause righteousness to prevail uh, it just takes the hand of God. It just takes his, uh, what he, you know, uh, his manifestation and his dealing with mankind overall. Anyway, in, in verse um, three, it says, and, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So God's going to mind wickedness, but uh, for a thousand years, but after that, wickedness will be loosed. And the way that happens is, is in this final resurrection of the unjust, whatever condition these people uh, died in, uh, they'll resurrect in that same condition. And as I'm gonna try to cover here in a little while that everyone in that resurrection is unjust. 
And I want to I want to explain to you that we haven't always taught that that way in this this way in this body. We always felt like that uh, that the Old Testament worthies resurrected in the New Testament church after Jesus's resurrection, but the rest of the unjust, the just and unjust, would resurrect after the thousand years. But I'm going to explain to you why there's no one just in that final resurrection after the thousand years. And so that's somewhat new. Not everyone and not every minister in the body sees it that way. Uh, but after, you know, here, here's where we're at is uh, knowledge until God reveals knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, we can have an ideology that's incorrect. And that's where we're still, we're still working as a ministry on areas that we're not in agreement on. And, uh, and I do believe I've been in this for four, you know, for 45 years now. And I do believe that the Lord has prevented us to come from coming together on a doctrine that's not the right doctrine. God, God will not let us get settled on it. Uh, you know, I mentioned that uh, at the campground this, this past June. I, I said, um, um, I said, there's been many men speak in the last few years with a lot of boldness, making statements that the you can make the bride of Christ now. And uh, several men has even said you could make it, you know, down through the thousand years. And I said, you brothers need to, I said, I, I want y'all to give me the right to make a bold statement that I don't believe that. I do not believe that you can make the bride now, nor during the thousand, during this Gentile world. I said, you know, and God, may be keeping us separate on that until we come together in, in the full understanding of it. So I appreciate being a, a part of a ministry that allows and lets men explain themselves and that we um, are to have a spirit towards one another where we'll consider and listen to one another. Every one of us should want the truth. We should all, if there's anything wrong in what we're believing or, or saying, ministers, preaching, we should want that corrected. We should never want our ideology to be usurped over the truth of God's word. And so we have to, I'll, I'll just say to you here, here not too long ago, I was writing uh, the second article I wrote on the book of on the book of Revelations concerning the seventh chapter, and I started writing on that, and I just felt such a check. I just felt something's wrong here, and I just get up from my desk and my computer, and and I would uh, dwell on it, pray, talk to God, and. Uh, I went back to my computer uh, several times and I couldn't move forward. Finally, God showed me a part in this, just one verse in the scripture that I was missing. And when I saw that, I began to open my mind and I would begin to see a difference in how that one verse made it difference in the whole explanation of the beginning of that chapter and God began to open my mind I don't know necessarily how to explain that to y'all but all I can tell you is uh, I've been in the ministry since I was a young man and I've just learned that I know when God's dealing with me I can tell the difference between I'm just thinking and whether or not there's a, a gift and the spirit of God working in my mind, through my mind. And so once God opened my mind to that, I began to get an understanding of it. And I, it changed the whole way that I was explaining that part of the 
book of Revelation there, but it just fit like a glove. And, and so I made a change. I had to change. And uh, but I feel very good about it because I feel like God helped me with it. And it makes more sense than what I was saying. It fits more with the plan of God overall. And so uh, God still, he's still on the throne. He's still correcting his ministry and helping us. Um, okay, here's the part I wanted to get to in um, the fourth verse. It says, I saw thrones and they set upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the songs, souls of them We're in Revelation 20, verse four. That were, oh, as a matter of fact, let me see here. I don't know, Brother Painter, if that can be seen on the screen. Let, let me just see here just a minute. I see a chat. I'm muted because we will receive feed God. If I don't, okay, got your message. Um, let me let me see if I can share a bigger screen than that. How about that? Is that better? Can y'all see that okay, brother? Brother Painter, can you text me and let me know if, if you see that, if y'all are able to see that? Since you're not able, it doesn't look like you're able to put the scriptures up there and me up there both. So, um, I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, verse four here, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in his hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now here it's being revealed to us these thrones were rulers. You remember Jesus said, they that overcome them will reign, rule and reign with me for a thousand years with a rod of iron. And this is where this takes place after the after Armageddon and, and in the beginning of the thousand years, the bride is made up. And these are they that are on thrones or they're in rulership and judgments given to them. And it says they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God. That doesn't mean their literal head was cut off. It means that they overcame their own will and learned how to rest in God and do his will and cease from their own labors. He became their head. I mentioned, I've mentioned it many times, but it's worth mentioning again how the brother, I believe it was Paul and Pat Jones from uh, Fort Worth, Texas, back when they first found the body many years ago, I believe it was Brother Paul, it could have been Pat, but I believe it was Paul that went to a campground meeting, his first meeting. And the other one stayed home. These are these guys were identical twins, if I remember right. I remember both of them. And uh, anyway, so Brother Jones, he was there at the camp meeting, and and the that day that this, he had a, a vision that night, but that day before the day was closed and he, he was in service and they discussed this very scripture and they were explaining how this beheading of these, these bride members was not a natural beheading, but that Jesus had become their head. He listened to that that day and heard them talk about it, relate to it, question on it, that night when he went into the dormitory there on the campground and, and was in a room in his bed, he said, I was laying there in my bed and I heard something at my door and the door opened and an angel in a big white robe walked in my room and he had a big sword in his hand and he sat up on his bed 
he said that angel walked right over to him and took that sword in his hand and just reared back and just brought that sword right through his neck and cut his head off. And he said, I reached up and grabbed my head. He said, the angel left. He said, I was sitting there were holding my head and I thought if I move, I'm dead because my head's been cut completely off. If I move, I'm, I'm gonna die. But he laid like he stayed like that for a while, and he finally got to feeling around his neck to see if he could find any blood, and he didn't find any blood, couldn't feel anything wet. Finally, after a period of time, he started trying to move his head just a little bit, and he began to realize that he this was a vision. He really didn't have his head cut off. And then his mind went back to the teaching of that day, and he got a... a, a a vision there in an experience of understanding that, you know, you to, to make the bride, Jesus is going to have to become your head. And so these people are talking about people that made the bride. Then verse five here says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such. The second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and Christ and reign with him a thousand years. So this is talking about the bride, and this is called the first resurrection. We've always taught that uh, this first resurrection actually starts uh, it's a spiritual thing. It's not a natural resurrection. This is not a resurrection, people resurrecting out of the grave. You need to know there's three resurrections. There's one, there's there's a resurrection that was available in the New Testament church whereby a person could receive the Holy Ghost, grow to a full measure in God, a full uh, maturity, which is called perfection overcome sin and become and inherit everlasting life and become a part of the bride of Christ. And that wasn't a resurrection from the grave. All other resurrections, the resurrection of the just is of the from the grave. The resurrection of the unjust is from the grave. The resurrection of the just is for the purpose of resurrecting during a time when you can have eternal judgment unto life like these that could be in the first resurrection and it could still be called the first resurrection in your life if you resurrected some of these people right here were old testament worthies and i would even include uh the 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 faithful in the antediluvian world before the flood before noah and the flood uh like abel and shem and Enoch, and the righteous line. Those people came up in a resurrection of the just, uh, and they came up for the opportunity of being part of the bride. When you look at the overall plan of God, God spent the first 4,000 years uh, getting the world ready to bring Christ into the world to reconcile man from the fallen sins of Adam to uh, Christ. I mean, uh, I'm going to give you a scripture on that where uh, in Romans 5, verse 12, and I'm sorry, but you just, you know, I mean, I could go to it, but well, I mean, I guess I can go to it. Let's see here. Oh no, it's wrong. Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, that was Adam. And so death passed upon all them, all men. 
for that all have sinned. Uh, you see, uh, when Adam fell, there was not another man after the fall born of God, not until Jesus came into the world. No man had ever been born again. We were all born of Adam. So not one of us was born as a baby that had a smidgen of God in us, the nature of God. We have to be born again. Jesus came to make that possible. Uh, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, let's go there. I'll put it on the board for you here. Maybe verse 20, 21. Uh, 20, uh, here, 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. That includes this resurrection, not from the grave, but resurrecting from the death that passed on every man. When you're born again, you have to die out. There has to be a, a death to the, to, the, to the Adamic nature in you. At least you you're not going to get rid of it overnight, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to tell God, I'm willing to die out to that. And I'm willing to be born of your spirit. And that's a resurrection of that death that passed on every man when you're born of the Holy Ghost. For as Adam and all die, even so in Christ and all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, he was the very first one that was alive as a human being born of God. Afterward, they are Christ, they that are Christ at his coming. So it will take, you know, the coming of the Lord. And that's another thing we've got to understand is the coming of the Lord is, it took place on the day of Pentecost. Jesus, his sacrifice for you and I was accepted of God and he gave life on the day of Pentecost. And so uh, uh, so we, we had an opportunity there of being born again of this first resurrection. Well, the, that, that resurrection from that death that passed on every man started when you got the Holy Ghost. But that resurrection... <laughs> It's a spiritual resurrection, and it's not a finished resurrection until you've got your head cut off or until Jesus truly becomes your head and you become, um, till you come to the fullness of the image of Christ that Paul mentioned in, in Ephesians 4. So a person that reaches that place, second death hath no power over them. Um, so, and that's, uh, where does it stake that here? Um, it may, let me get it here in just a second. Here it is. In verse six, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power. Second death is you're born with death overshadowing you. There's no hope for eternal life when you're born of Adam. And if you die in, in, in your sins, then second death, which is the lake of fire, which is second death, the Bible tells us. Here, there's a scripture uh, on that. Uh, right here in verse 13, the sea gave up the dead that was in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That is second death. This is second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So I'm just showing you the, the resurrection unto life, the first resurrection of receiving the Holy Ghost and that spiritual resurrection being made complete 
that you finally overcome sin and inherit life and you resurrect fully from that Adamic nature, the state of the Adamic life, um, and you finally mature to a full uh, measure of Christ in the Holy Ghost nature, the nature of God that you've been born of. That's the first resurrection. But then these other, the resurrection of the unjust, it, it's a natural resurrection from the grave so that you can finish your course. I was going to say earlier that it looked like God spent the first 4,000 years to bring that possibility through Christ to man. Then after he harvested that world and got everything saved out of it, he could. He started with a new world, the Gentile world, 2,000 year world that started in darkness, limited understanding, can't see much at night. Uh, you can't understand much. You can't see very far off. And God has to bring us to a brightness, you know, or a full sevenfold light of illumination and understanding. Same place that the first testament had, but it take God 2,000 years to bring us to the same place it took 2,000 years to bring the Jews to. So, and it looks like God spent that whole 6,000 years to make up his bride. Think about that. And then the next thousand years during the millennial clean up the entire world. And then the unjust is going to resurrect. I want to get on to that. Uh, so it says in verse seven here, when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. That's because these people are going to resurrect and they're all going to come up with the same spirit and ideologies that they went down with, and they're all unjust. And they'll go out to deceive the nations, which are four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together into battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. I just want to mention now, uh, and it looks like that before God's finished with this whole group of unjust people that he's going to, uh, that he's going to resurrect, they're unjust, okay? Uh, many of them are going to reject the message that they hear and see in manifest the manifested uh, manifestation of God's full sevenfold light down there. And don't I know it don't seem possible, but they they looked at the majority of Israel rejected it just because you resurrect from the grave don't mean you're, you're going to get it just because you resurrected. It's amazing how man can go through all kinds of unbelievable experiences. I mean, a guy can go to a war and be in foxholes and be shooting guns and, and bazookas and, and everything, and one another killing man and going through watching death and, and of the multitudes right before his eyes, and then he gets out of that, he's done his service, he comes back home and goes back to life. And in a little while, he'll start, he, he, he may have some repercussions emotionally and mentally from it, but life will return and, and he'll adjust. Most men do, but some, I understand some men have trouble, but I'm just showing you the human mind can adjust you know, you may not be able to get along with any and everybody, but you get in a foxhole with them and people start shooting at both of you and you start trying to protect everything in that foxhole, you all of a sudden start getting along with people you would have never got along with before. Anyway, so many of these people, they're going to rise up against God and his people. God's going to destroy them. He's not going to let them ever you know, here, look, verse nine, they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the saints, camp of the saints about the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That, that torment just means that the remembrance and the judgment that brought about that destruction will never be forgotten. 
Uh, now here, here's the part I want to get to. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no, pl no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. That's the word of God. And the dead were judged out of the things, the things that were written in the books. So... One time I, I got up and mentioned that I said, these books are records. If you do some research on it, you'll see these books are records. God has a record of every one of our lives will be judged for every deed. I don't mean God goes down through every little thing you ever done, said, okay, now this right here, I'm going to judge you for this. Here, look what you've done here, I'm going to judge. No, it means God is, God's got a record of everything you've done, and he's going to correct you of all of that. If you're ever going to overcome sin and inherit everlasting life, God's going to have to correct you of everything that is in your life that would cause you to do this, some of the things you've done that were wrong. A man got up behind me and he said, I don't believe what Brother Smith said. He said, because I believe in the book of remembrance, like we've always taught it. I didn't say anything to him because he was the kind of man that just would argue with a wall. But I, I wanted to tell him, I'm saying the exact same thing you're saying. This is God's book of remembrance of all the things that all of us has done. He's got a record of all of us and all these books. You know, is the records that he has of all of us, which is in his book of remembrance. Anyway, verse 13 said, and the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is second death. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I said the book of life was the word of God. That is, if you don't become part of God's eternal plan, which is the word of God is God's eternal plan. And if you're not, if you, if you don't, if you're not included in that, then you won't live. You won't be granted everlasting life. But now these two groups, there's two groups here that gives up the dead that's in him. The first one's the sea. And the sea there is the world. Revelation 17. Let's I'm going to go back there just briefly because I almost never do this, but it's probably important that I do it from time to time. Right here, uh, this woman, let me go back here, said, I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore which setteth upon many waters. Well, if you remember in the 13th chapter, it's worded a little bit different where John saw seven horned beast, seven horns, uh, ten, seven heads and, and ten horns come up out of the sea. That's the same as this many waters that this woman is sitting upon many waters. Okay, well then down here, uh, the angel tells John in verse 15, and he saith unto me, these waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Sorry I'm having to use these, you know, explicit words, but they're biblical words. God's very plain. Uh, and, you know, it's not words we normally would use, but it, 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 God gets plain at times. Uh, but anyway, I'm just showing you this scripture because um, um, the sea, I'm going back here now to verse 13, to Revelation 20, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the sea which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Um, 
So the C is the world. This represents God's people. They're unjust because they're back in the world. They're not in the church. They went back out into the world. They're God's children. They became a part of God's plan. They became his child through salvation. And, uh, and you know, I've had people say, well, can they resurrect if they never got the Holy Ghost? Yes. People in the Old Testament, none of them had the Holy Ghost. They, they, can't, they resurrected to get it. And I've had people tell me, well, they can't anybody resurrect in, in a restored church because the Holy Ghost was made available in the New Testament church. Yes, it was made available, but the church fell away. And all through the dark ages, there ain't anybody even knew what the Holy Ghost was. Um, you know, so the, as a matter of fact, they didn't even, most Gentiles didn't have as much knowledge about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the Jews did under the old covenant. So if you think God would give them a resurrection, there's no reason at all that he wouldn't give a resurrection. Plus we've got scriptures. So the sea gives up the dead that was in it. God's children that's out there in the world, they're unjust, they're not living for God, but they are God's children, but they lived and died in a time when they never saw or heard the full manifestation of God. Even right now, if somebody dies, if somebody goes out in the world, God's child and dies out there, they're going to come up in this resurrection because they have never seen or heard a full manifestation of God like was in the New Testament church. Now, if they live during that time, they will be judged because eternal judgment's there. But if they die before that or after the falling away of the church, then they're, they're God's children, they're unjust, and God is that just and merciful that he will give them an opportunity to see a full manifestation of God before he judges them eternally and puts him in this, uh, cast him into the second death, the lake of fire, the destruction. So, so these people could have died anywhere before the New Testament church. They could have died after the falling away of the New Testament church. If they live during the time of the New Testament church, they will be judged in that world because it's available. They can see if they're God's children, God's going to see to it that they have an opportunity to see a manifestation of God and they will be judged either worthy or unworthy of life. And that won't happen again to the unjust until the church is restored down here. And that's why there will be a resurrection of these people after the thousand years. They're not worthy to come up. They're not faithful. They're not worthy to be a part of the bride. It'll take a rule of a rod of iron to correct them. Uh, and that they'll come up in the final resurrection to inherit eternal life, but they, they won't have an opportunity for the bride. The just have an opportunity for that. All right. And then uh, also the fullness of God's manifestation down through the thousand years, the millennium there will be the full judgment of God, eternal judgment unto life or death then. And so those that live where God's manifestation is, they'll be judged at that time and won't come up down there. All right, so then death and hell delivered up the dead that which were in them. I want to explain this, what this actually is. And the best way to explain it is to go back to Isaiah, uh, the 28th chapter. And I want you to see that this is talking about the New Testament church. It's talking about a time when the coming of the Lord, I was going to say earlier, to understand the coming of the Lord, he came. On the day of Pentecost, he, his coming lasted 45 years. 
until AD 70 or so, and then the church fell away. And then he's coming again in a restored church down here. And he'll have another harvest and he'll gather the remainder of his bride down here. And there'll be a resurrection of the just to be a part of that. Just like there was a part of those of the Jewish world and even including those faithful in the antediluvian world before the flood had an opportunity for this. But here in the 28th chapter of Isaiah, uh, this is talking about the New Testament church. Uh, the restored church could be included, uh, especially in application. He said, whom shall we teach knowledge or who will we make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept on precept, line on line, line upon line, here little, there little. For with stammering lips in another term, tongue, will he speak unto this people? This was the day of Pentecost when they received the Holy Ghost and spake with unknown tongues, and it was a cloven tongue. They spoke with a known tongue, other tongues, and stammering lips on the day of Pentecost. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. So you enter into your Sabbath. I appreciate it, Brother Talley's talk Thursday night. Y'all had a good service Thursday night. Sorry I couldn't have been there, but I was with you. And, you know, I watched it. And this is the rest. This is the Sabbath. This is where you cease from your labors and enter into his rest. That is through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the beginning of it. it takes time to get to the place where you fully yield over and cease from doing your own will. That's actually perfection. It takes time. This is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now look what it says, but under the word of the Lord was under them precept on precept, precept on precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little, there little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. The word God keeps working on these precepts one after the other, he keeps bringing judgment. And if it's not heeded to, you'll be snared with the judgment of God. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Now, here's what I want you to get. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are at agreement, when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. This is, this is when God corrects the overflowing scourge. That's a whip. You get scourged with a whip. When God begins to, to chastise his people from their evil, that's in the sin that's in them, when that pass through, it shall not come up to us. Well, we, this is what they're saying. Those that made a covenant, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, Highlight that, shouldn't I? And with hell, they're in agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall be passed through, but they're saying that ain't gonna, that's not gonna judge us. God's not gonna judge us. For we've made lies our refuge. And under falsehood, we have hid ourselves. Now, now I want you to consider this. Oh, I didn't want that. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's remove that highlight. Um, then, um, I, can't, I can't do it. I can't get there. I'll do it later. Uh, so here, here's what death, they've made a covenant with, de with death. This is people today. It's people back then. People that 
they feel like they're okay. They don't have to overcome the, the adamic nature that's caused death to come on every man. They feel like I'm okay. They have, they've made lies their refuge and that under falsehood, they hid themselves. And with hell, they're in agreement. That's a religious ideology that I, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be judged by God. I think I'm living good enough life. I don't think that I'm going to be judged unworthy. You ought to mark this in your Bible and link it up with Revelation 6, where the fourth rider of a pale horse was death. The rider was death and hell followed with it. It's the exact same thing Isaiah is talking about here. The Catholic Church made a covenant with death. You don't have to do anything to be saved eternally. All you got to do is say your heavenly fathers, your hell marries, you know, give your money to the church, live, do the best you can do, and you're going to be saved. That is... That's making a covenant with death. I don't think I have to overcome the death that came upon every man. I don't think I have to. I, the, the flesh is going to have to be judged and I'm going to have to become spiritual and righteous. And this religious ideology, and it's not just the Catholic Church. All these churches out here have it. It's in the body of Christ. There's people in this body. They're not serving God to his fullness. They're not trying to be faithful. They've got, they've made a covenant with death and they're in agreement with hell. And that's what is being said over here in the 20th chapter, death and hell give up the dead that were in it, in them. And those that don't come out of that and ex accept the plan of God and go on and, and finish their course and inherit eternal life, if they maintain that ideology, then they are going to be cast into the lake of fire, which is second death. What I'm trying to show you is there's two groups of people, those ungodly, those that are God's children, they're sin, they're sinners. They're not ungodly because they're God's children. They're ungodly sinners. Peter called them, I believe it was him. God's people that's in the world, they're, uh, they're, they're unjust. Those that had this ideology that they've made a covenant with death and covered their self with lies, they're unjust and they will have to come to the truth and acknowledge God's judgment or they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is second death, as well as those that are in the sea. So I'm just trying to show you there's nobody just in those two groups. That's why we cannot see that anybody just could come up in those two groups of people. So we've had to change on our doctrine of that, and I'm running out of time. So I hope that I've made myself a little bit clear, clearer on this particular subject. Seems like God just gives me, gives me more and a better way of explaining it, at least in my mindset, and I'm just trying to do my best to help y'all uh, in every way that I can. I want to thank you today for listening to me, for giving me this time. I wish I could be there with you. I, I just cannot sit down very long uh, at, at this time, especially if I had on, you know, uh, my suit suit pants and was bound up like that. I, you know, I'm just this surgery is just it's. But I want to tell you this: I'm improving. The doctor thought he may have to take me back into surgery because I was having so much complications with the surgery that he gave me. But I can I feel confident that God's going to let me get over this, and I'm improving. I feel like next week's going to be much much better week. I'm supposed to go back to the doctor too. So keep praying for me. 
mentioned to Brother Painter today, Sister Dave's had a fall yes, last night, and uh, I don't know if it was where she hit her head on a curb uh, that caused, they said a brain bleed, but this morning's report was that she's had a stroke. She's paralyzed on the right side, so we certainly need to pray for Sister Dave's and Brother Dave's, the family and the church there in Godfrey. They did get her right to the hospital, and they do say if they can get a person with stroke to the hospital within four hours, they generally can get at least part, if not all, the movement back. So let's pray for that. I'm sure Brother Painter will tell you more about it. Anyway, keep praying for me. Uh, I really do appreciate it. I feel like I'll be back in church next week. Thanks for, for all your prayers. I love all of you. I love the work. I want to say how much I appreciate yesterday's work, the work day. Uh, the air conditioner we bought, Brother T Paul Thompson, God bless his heart. But he got it blowing cold and blowing good, and it's everything's working, so... Brother Durham and the brethren are, all the brethren are working on getting that, that little project completed. But thank all of you for all your work. And your, uh, I feel like God will help us have a good youth meeting. Keep it in your prayers that God will cover that meeting and, and touch the youth in this body and help them in every way possible in that meeting. God bless all of you. Have a good day. I'll be watching you on on uh, on the live uh, broadcast. God bless. I'm going to stop this recording now and. Um,